Bet I fooled you, ha ha. First Corinthians 15, ha. Huh? <laughs> we will be back in Revelation 20 next week. I want to share this, <clears throat> excuse me, with you. I can't remember the name of the, uh, the cartoon uh, that are in the paper. They used to be in the paper. I don't take the paper anymore, so uh, either by paper or in the mail or online or anything, but they used to be in the comic strip. I don't remember the name of it. It was the Little Cavemen guys. Remember them? The little Cavemen guys? Of course, there's no such thing as cavemen anyway, but... BP? EP? <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's a picture of this right here. I really like this. The first guy's sitting on a, a rock, and he's looking out into the, into the sky there, and he's just kind of like dreaming. And the other guy's, his friend, is in back of him. So the guy's sitting down there, and he says these words. He says, I hate the term Good Friday. You know, when Christ was crucified. I hate the term Good Friday. And his friend in the back of him says, why? And then he says, my Lord was hanged on a tree that day. And the guy in the back of him says these words. If you were going to be hanged on that day, and he volunteered to take your place, how would you feel? And the first guy said, good. I would feel good. And the other guy says, have a nice day. <laughs> good Friday. Jesus died on the cross for you, for me that we could have new life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Praise God. I got to say it. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. <laughs> I love it. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the celebration of this day where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Lord, thank you so much. Your stamp of approval of the sacrifice. Lord God, thank you. I pray, Lord, as we have met together here faithfully, that you will, by your Spirit, Speak to our hearts, our very soul. Teach us, instruct us in your word. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Adolf Raquel. I love this story. I may have used it several years ago. I don't remember. But Adolf Raquel, what a guy. He was German. With a name like that, you can imagine. All the Adolfs in the world weren't bad, you know. Anyway, Adolf Raquel, he was German. And he was a noted great conductor of symphonies and music. A conductor, not of a train, <laughs> but of symphonies and music and stuff, and composer. He indeed had his own orchestra and his own choir, and they would travel all over Europe and other places for symphonies and concerts and stuff. And it was very, very uh, wonderful and very, very good. And the true story is told how that on one occasion, when they were rehearsing, the final rehearsal before they uh, would go on stage for their production of uh, the symphony of Handel's Messiah. Now, many of you hear that during Christmas time, a lot of you, but Handel's Messiah. And during that whole episode of Handel's Messiah, which goes through the, the life of Christ, it comes to the point where 
the choral, the choir here, with the orchestra playing, comes up to a, a crescendo, and, it, and the soloist is a soprano, and she sings, I know my Redeemer lives. So she got to that point. He taps his baton, the rehearsal, so the orchestra strop, stops. And, and all the people in the chorus and people in the, the orchestra, uh, too, looked at him because they, they thought that uh, they would expect a response of approval because she sang it flawlessly. She sang it enunciating the words clearly. Perfect breathing, everything. Beautiful voice. So he taps his baton again for silence. And he walks up to the young sopranoist, young lady. And he says these words. He says, my daughter, you do not really believe in the Redeemer, do you? That he liveth. She was embarrassed, to say the least. And she said, well, yes. Yes, I do. He said, most emphatically then, he said, then sing it. Tell it to me so that I will know you have experienced the joy and the power of the living Redeemer. He walked back to his podium there, tapped his little baton, and they started back again, coming up to that same part in Messiah. This time, she sang the truth with fervor from her soul. She testified through her music and her beautiful voice of her personal knowledge of the risen Lord. And those who listened were so moved, they began shedding tears. And Raquel, after stopping the orchestra, his eyes wet with tears as well walked up to her and he said, you do know, you do know him. For this time, you have told me. We sing a lot of songs here on Sunday morning. We sing songs today that pertain to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I thought about that, and I wrote me a notation right here, resurrection. Do we really believe it? Do we really believe it? 1 Corinthians 15, there were evidently many in the early church at Corinth that didn't. This teaching had crept into the church. And so Paul is addressing this in chapter 15 of the book of 1 Corinthians, and he says in verse 12, he says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. 
you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep or died in Christ, believing that, are lost. Forever lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. If you go through the early church in the book of Acts, you know, the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four different slants on the gospel, Jesus, the life of Christ. And then the church is born, Acts chapter 2, and the Holy Spirit comes. The church is born, and the church goes, and the rest of the book of Acts is about the early church and the places that Paul the apostle went and preached the gospel and visited, and, and people were saved. They were born again. They came into the church family. Churches were founded and started all over Turkey and Macedonia and Greece, let alone Palestine and Italy. And if you go through the book of Acts, the central message that they preached, the central message that they preached in the gospel, yes, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. The vicarious atoning sacrifice that God provided in His Son. But then they preach the resurrection. Do you see what he's saying right here? If there is no resurrection, then all the rest of it's bogus. Doesn't count for anything. You can say, well, Muhammad died for my sins, but he's dead. Or how about uh, the followers of Hinduism or Buddha or Shinto or, or even some of the false teachings that is around in our own country. Jehovah's Witnesses, others. If there is no resurrection, then all the rest of it's futile, like Paul says. And so they preached the resurrection, and it was the resurrection of Jesus Christ when they preached, especially to the, in the synagogues and to the Jewish people that were filled with a lot of uh, Sadducees and stuff that did not believe in a resurrection, that they got in trouble all the time. They were constantly persecuted. And even to the Gentiles in Athens, Greece, Acts 17, when he preached and they're listening, but when he went to the, come to the resurrection... That was too much to take in, right? He's got to be a little nutsy. Resurrection. Very, very, very important. Everything hinges on it. Because, see, with the resurrection, it is God saying he is satisfied. The word there is propitious. He is satisfied with that sacrifice. I approve and you raise Jesus from the dead to show that. You know, Jesus is the only one in all the religious figures that you can ever find that stated, that said, I'm going to die. I'm going to raise again. I'm going to come back to life. I'm going to be resurrected. He's the only one. Nobody else could ever say that. How could they? They don't have the power to do that. Jesus does. And he did. Very quickly, ha uh ha, -huh. very quickly I want to go through just three quick points. See, every pastor has three points. First of all, the resurrection of Jesus was prophesied in the, in the Old Testament. Whenever he talks about in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, and even Paul's writings, when he says the Scripture says, or the Scripture says, he's always referring to the Old Testament. They didn't have a New Testament yet. They were writing it, but they didn't have it yet. It's the Old Testament. So the Scripture says, and he's referring to the Old Testament. So uh, the Scripture states that the resurrection of Jesus 
It was prophesied, promised, promised. You can go to Isaiah 53, you can go to Psalm 22, uh, you can go to Hosea 6, you can go to various places and see the prophecy of the resurrection in this case of Jesus. But we'll look at Psalm 16. Turn to that one. Psalm 16. This psalm is written by David, Israel's greatest king, and to whom God made a covenant with, called the Davidic covenant, an unconditional covenant, that God would put a man on the throne, and his kingdom would be forever. And of course, that will be Jesus. But anyway, here we are in Psalm 16. Now, I want you to understand that David, as king, wrote this psalm. He was called Israel's singer. The psalms, you know, are songs. And these songs were sung, many of them, by the Jewish people in their times of worship and stuff. But uh, this is a psalm of David who wrote over, what, 75 or more of the psalms that occur in the book of Psalms in the Bible. And he wrote this, and David was king, you know, 950, 1000 B.C., before Christ. And he wrote this psalm. Now, I'm going to read the whole psalm of chapter 16 here, the psalm 16, but uh, verse 8. David said, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Why? Because you, God, will not abandon me to Sheol, the grave. He adds this to it. Nor will you let your Holy One see decay. What happens when a body dies? Well, their body begins to decay very soon. No time. But the promise that he's making here, the prediction here, is that the Holy One of God, his body evidently is going to die, but it's not going to see decay. Okay, flip up to Acts chapter 2. Or no, excuse me, it is there, but Acts chapter 13. I decided to use chapter 13. I forgot about that. In Acts chapter 13, Paul is on his first missionary journey. And he goes from uh, Antioch, which is in present day Lebanon today. And he travels down through the island in, in the Mediterranean of Crete. And he goes on up into what is present day Turkey. And he comes up through Pamphylia. And he, and, and he comes up to some other cities up there where he will found churches. Present-day Turkey, which is now 99% Muslim. Started out with a lot of Christianity in it. Well, the first thing that Paul always did was he always went to the synagogues. Oh, no wonder I can't find it. I'm in Romans. <laughs> that didn't work. He always goes to the synagogues. He's in uh, Pisidia, Antioch. It goes by Pisidia Antioch because there were five or six different cities named Antioch because they were founded by Antiochus, the king, the Seleucus king of that whole area there. And he liked his name so well, he named a lot of cities after it. So it's Pisidia Antioch in present-day Turkey. And he goes to the synagogue, to the Jewish people, and he preaches. Verse 32. He says, we tell you the good news, what God promised our fathers. He has fulfilled for us their, their children by raising up Jesus, as it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. Read on. The fact that God raised him, Jesus, from the dead, never to decay, is stated in these words. And he quotes... Psalm 16, 
I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now here's the thing. When David penned that down by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, Psalm 16, it is a thousand years plus before Paul recites it here. A thousand years! It hadn't been fulfilled yet, but now it has. Jesus is who he's talking about. A thousand years. And he quotes it and gives it credit to Jesus. Resurrection of Jesus prophesied. One other one real quickly. Uh, you don't need to turn to it if you don't want to. Jesus in the early part of his ministry in John's gospel. The early part of his ministry in John's gospel recorded there. It's a second chapter. And the second chapter is where he did his first miracle in Cana of Galilee. What was that? Uh, you all know that one, don't you? You wine bibers, you. He turned the water into wine. At a wedding feast. Remember, that's John chapter 2. But then he went on to Jerusalem because it's a feast time. And the Jews were required, all the men especially, were required three times a year to go to Jerusalem to keep these feasts, like Passover and Pentecost and Tabernacles. They were to go to Jerusalem, offer sacrifices, and be there. Anyway, to worship God. So Jesus comes to Jerusalem, and remember, that's the first time he's seen this. He come to Jerusalem, it's like coming into the church here, and we got a bunch of raffles going on. We got a bunch of tables here with all kinds of, of uh, different uh, gambling things going on, if you will, or money exchanging, and, and uh, different. they had different animals that you could buy for sacrificing, and you, you could do all this kind of stuff. They had all this stuff, and Jesus comes and he said, this is supposed to be a a house of prayer, and you made it a den of thieves. And remember, he goes around and he, un he, he flips over the tables. I gotta not get carried away here. <laughs> he flips over the tables and he, he does all this stuff and he drives them out and stuff. You've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. And it says the disciples remembered that. They remembered that the scripture said way back there, that the zeal of the Lord will do this, you know. But then he went on, and all the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders and everybody, they come storming up there, and he says, what gives you the authority to do this? This kind of, I'm ab-libbing a little bit. And he says these words, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Oh, you are crazy. It took our fathers 42 years to build this temple. They weren't even finished with it yet. Herod was busy at doing it. He had over 400 workers, slaves, labor. 42 years, and you say you're going to raise it up in three days. <laughs> but John goes on to say in the word of God, he wasn't speaking about this temple he was speaking about this temple, his body. So even Jesus predicted, if you will, the resurrection. Three years later, it would happen. Even Jesus. So the scripture, over and over again, the resurrection of Jesus is prophesied about promise. Second point, man, I got to fly. The resurrection of Jesus was produced it was produced. It really happened. There's only one miracle in the Bible. Well, actually, there were two now, but there was only one miracle that Jesus did in the four gospel accounts that they all recorded, and that was the feeding of the 5,000. All four of them. Now, the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they record a lot of things similarly, and so they're called the synoptic gospels. John writes his gospel account years later, and he is writing about a lot of things that they didn't include. Certainly not contradicting anything, just things they didn't include, uh, things he remembered, and of course it's all done by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. But this miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, they all recorded. But there's something else they all recorded. 
And that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All four of them. And the one who wrote the most lengthy account wasn't even a Jew. Luke. You're going to turn to Luke 24, but first I want you to look at look at look at one. Look at Luke 1. The credentials. It's enough to know that God inspired Luke to write what he wrote. But there's always people who say, "Ah, yeah, maybe." Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Now Luke is writing uh, after Matthew and Mark. Luke isn't a Jew, he's a Gentile, if you call him that. But he's also a doctor. He was no slouch, he was an intelligent man. He was a doctor, Colossians tells us that. He was a historian. So he says in verse 1, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first, the apostles, that is, and others, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself, look what he says, I have carefully investigated everything from the beginning it's from the birth of Jesus, from the incarnation. It seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Now chapter 24. Luke gives the longest account of the resurrection day. The resurrection of Christ and the day and the things that happened. Matthew records, Mark records, John records, and they're all wonderful. But Luke gives the most lengthy record. So he starts out in chapter 24, verse 1, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared, and they were going or went to the tomb. I was up early this morning. I get up early every morning, but this morning uh, I do the chores a little bit earlier because I need to get down here and, and uh, get ready. So I was up and out feeding the cows and the chickens and the dogs and the ducks and stuff out there doing that at 6 o'clock this morning. And at 6 o'clock this morning, if you were up, you've seen this, but if not, 6 o'clock this morning I'm out there, it was beautiful. Uh, air was fresh and clean. It was breaking, just breaking daylight. And up into the right in the sky was a, was a half moon. Kind of hazy, but there was the moon and, and there were clouds and it was beautiful out. And the birds were waking up and beginning to chirp. And I just stopped a minute and I thought... It was a lot like that when the women were going to the tomb early in the morning. And they were taking spices because they're going to do some more spicing, embalming of Jesus. They didn't embalm, but I mean wrapping in spices so that the odor wouldn't be so bad as a body de decomposes and, and decays. And they were talking amongst themselves Who's going to roll away the stone? It's too big for us. Plus, there's a big guard there, a bunch of guard, a bunch of Roman soldiers. And it's been sealed. What are we going to do? It says in verse 3, but when they entered or excuse me, verse 2, they found the stone was rolled away from the tomb. And when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. And in their fright, the women bowed down to their faces of the ground. But the men, angels they were, said to them, 
Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you? And he did many times in the gospel accounts. While he was still in Galilee. Verse 9. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven. The apostles that were left. Judas has gone out and he was just hanging around. That was a pun, you know. He hung himself. (laughs) They told all these things to the eleven, all the others. It was Mary Magdalene. She was the first one that saw Jesus. That's what inspired me on that song, He Rose Again. When I wrote that, I was thinking of Mary Magdalene. She was the very first one to see the risen Lord. Remember, she went back to the tomb. It was empty, and uh, no one in there. She came out, remember, and she's crying, and she's weeping, and she's sad because, and then Jesus appears to her. But she didn't know it was him because she's, she's crying, and, and she's upset, and she's, her head's hanging down. And Jesus said, what are, you, what are you crying about? She supposed he's the gardener, the keeper of it. And so she says words to like, I come for my Lord and he's not here. The body's gone. If you have removed him somewhere, please tell me so I can go and, and collect him, take him and stuff. And then Jesus says, Mary, nobody can speak your name like the one that loves you. And she looked up. And it was Jesus that I'm not dead. That inspired me to write that. Go and tell the others. And that was her going and telling the others. Can you imagine that? (laughs) It goes on to say in verse 11, or verse uh, 9, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, and the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because the word seemed to them like nonsense. The Greek word is leros, silly talk. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. John did with him, too. It doesn't say it here. It does in John's gospel. They didn't believe him. When I was in Alaska, lived there for several years, and uh, the first time we was up there, we were interning or helping out in a small little church that was just beginning up in Trapper Creek, Trapper Creek, Alaska. So we would gather, my wife and I would gather all our kids, four kids, and we'd hop in a car and we would travel up north about 40 miles to Trapper Creek. And we would have church there. And it was meeting in a little uh, school. And the school up there wasn't like the schools here. They were in little, you know, these little, these, uh, what do you call them, containers that these truck drives hauling up back forth or on trains and stuff. Something like containers, little module buildings. And there were three or four of them there. And we were meeting in one of them there. And we went up there. And it was it was Easter time or, or Resurrection Sunday. They didn't know me from Adam. And I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try something. And so we got there and uh, everything, we sang our songs and everything. And I got up to preach. This first time they ever heard me. First time I was there, and I was just meeting them all. And I got up there. I'd been recommended by somebody. And so I got up there to preach, and the first thing I said, it was Easter time, remember, I said, I know it's going to be hard for you to believe. I hardly believe it myself. But I seen Jesus. I saw him. Man, their eyes got about that big. And they said, oh boy, we got one of those guys here. I said, you know what you just felt right there? Just like those 11 did. Just like they did. These women came and told them, we've seen Jesus. Mary Magdalene. They didn't believe him. This is just a bunch of silly talk, nonsense. 
But they did. (laughs) They did. Luke talks more about it than anyone else. I was going to go into several other uh, scripture right here, but I need to move on to the last point. Promise, be quick. Not only is the resurrection of Jesus prophesied, secondly, the resurrection of Jesus was produced, really happened, but the resurrection of Jesus, listen, is the pattern, is the pattern. Back to 1 Corinthians 15. The rest of the story. Verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have died, fallen asleep, in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But... I circled that in my Bible. I highlighted the next verse, but I circled that. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep or died. The first fruits, the first one. For since death came through a man, Romans 5:12, Adam. The resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn. Christ, the first fruits. The first fruits. Of course, they were referring to the feast of first fruits that the Jews kept every year. And the feast of first fruits, when they came to Jerusalem, it was the priests and others would go down and they would gather a sheaf of usually barley, grain. They bring that sheaf up to the temple and to the offering place, and they would, uh, as it were, offer it to the Lord. It was a thanksgiving offering. It was representative of the entire barley harvest that was yet to come. And it was a pledge, as it were, or a guarantee that the remainder of the harvest would be realized. So Jesus is the first fruits of those who have died. The first one resurrected. Now, don't think of this. A resurrection body is different. You're not talking about raising someone from the dead like Lazarus or like Jairus' daughter or like the woman in Cana, her son. That's just a spirit coming back into their body and they become, they still had to die again. This is a resurrected body. This is a new body. This is a glorified body. This is an immortal body. The rest of Luke's gospel account talks about it. Jesus appeared to him. He says, resurrection. They stand back. They're afraid. Is it a ghost? We saw him die. He's dead. He's been buried. There he is. And he says, why are you fear? A ghost doesn't have flesh and blood. As you see, I have. Touch me. They're still amazed. They're still doubting. He says, you got anything here to eat? I love that. (laughs) And so they gave him broiled fish, remember? And he ate it in their presence to show them. It is I. I'm alive. And so in Revelation 1, in John's vision, he says, I was dead, but now I am alive forever and ever. Resurrection body. If you know Christ, you're going to get one. We're going to be raised again. If we die in this world, in this life, 
Our spirit goes to be with God, with Christ, but our bodies in the ground, they will be resurrected like his. Immortal. Perfect. And one of the greatest things we can eat all we want and it ain't going to look like this. <laughs> Praise God. Resurrection. Sir Walter Riley. I remember him because my dad used to smoke a pipe. He smoked cigarettes for many years and it ultimately got him. He died of cancer in his lungs and other places. He came to know the Lord before that, praise God. But I remember him smoking a pipe for many, many years. And I remember seeing the can. I can still see it in my, in my mind. A can like that, like our coffee comes in, except there was metal. And there was a picture on it of Sir Walter Riley. Many of you remember seeing tobacco like that. Sir Walter Riley. Because Sir Walter Riley did smoke a pipe. But Sir Walter Riley was a tremendous man. He helped colonize uh, America. But he's also one who went in search of El Dorado, the city of gold down in South America. In fact, he went on two expeditions. On the second expedition, his soldiers, many of them who were with him, unbeknownst to him, went and sacked a Spanish uh, fortress and stuff. They sacked it. And he didn't know that. But the Spanish were livid. And so when he returned to England, because of that, and because of the Spaniards and what they were demanding, he was arrested and put in the tower in prison. And he was executed. They chopped off his head to appease the Spanish government. In the tower where he was, they discovered a poem that he had written the night before he was executed. He was quite an avid poet. There are 31 poems that are still in existence that he had written that some of them were very notable. So they found this poem written the night before his death. This is how it reads. Even such is time that takes in trust. Our youth, our joys, our all we have, and it pays us but with age and dust. Who in the dark and silent grave when we have wandered all our ways, shut up the story of our days. But from this earth, this grave, this dust, my God shall raise me up, I trust. <laughs> You're going to be resurrected. So am I. So am I, because Christ rose from the grave. Praise God. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Now it teaches us the truth, because your word is truth. And about Jesus, not only did he live a perfect life, and he died a horrible death. You had to even forsake your own son as he became sin for us. He who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God. But then three days later, you raised him up. You raised his body he is alive. We serve a living Savior 
one who is at the right hand of God Almighty, interceding, advocating for us. A living Savior. Thank you. We praise you. We worship you. We honor you. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise through your name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.